Well, good, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending upon uh, where you are. And welcome to the SOCOM virtual town hall. This is our first attempt at a town hall meeting, and I want to start off by thanking uh, Dano Wade and, and his crew for kind of putting this together. Uh, I came to, to Dano uh, just a couple of weeks ago and said, look, I, I want to pull together a virtual town hall meeting and, uh, and figure out how we do this. And to his credit and that of his uh, crew here, he's done a great job on very short notice kind of setting this up. So the way we're going to do this today is uh, I'm going to make a few opening remarks, and then we've got uh, uh, different uh, levels, if you will, of questions. We've got some uh, folks that are live, and for those of you that are, are tapping in on Google+, Plus, you will be able to see that uh, at the bottom, we've got folks from AFSOC, USASOC, WARCOM, MARSOC, JSOC, all kind of at the, the bottom of the screen there. And then we've got some, uh, some tape-recorded questions that we will play. And then we've got some uh, questions that will come in uh, from Facebook, and uh, and we'll kind of take it in that order. Um, first, uh, obviously, uh, this young lady beside my beside me is my wife, George Ann. Uh, just kind of by way of background, George Ann and I've been married uh, about 35 years. Come this May, uh, we've got three children. Uh, my oldest boy was born in in 1979, and a, and a week after he was born, uh, I went on deployment for eight months. Uh, my second son uh, was born over in the Philippines in what we referred to colloquially as Jungle General, uh, where they had uh, you know, no uh, emergency care, no anesthesia. Uh, and then my, my uh, final child, my daughter, was born while I was on uh, deployment in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And the only reason I raise that is to let you know for the families out there that we do understand uh, what you as families have to go through. Uh, in, my, uh, in my career of almost 36 years now, uh, I've spent uh, close to 10 years away from home. So, you know, we can certainly empathize uh, with you and, and with your problems, and, uh, and hopefully we're going to be in a position to help you solve some of those problems. For the, uh, the Gold Star families that are out there, let me first uh, send my, my condolences to you. Uh, I can only imagine how tough it must be having to deal with the, uh, the loss of a loved one and, uh, and you should know that, uh, that everybody within our community uh, keeps you in their, their thoughts and prayers. And for those of you that uh, are spouses of our wounded warriors, uh, the, the same condolences and thoughts go out to you. Uh, and as we'll talk through in this, uh, this town hall, uh, hopefully we're doing a lot to be able to pro provide you the support that you need. Um, this, uh, earlier this week, I had an opportunity to, uh, to testify uh, on Capitol Hill on Tuesday, I was at the Senate Armed Services Committee, and on Wednesday, at the House Armed Services Committee. And candidly, uh, it might surprise a lot of folks, but but I actually enjoy doing that. It is democracy at work, and and what you should know of your uh, your elected officials is, you know, to a man and a woman, these are very good people. Uh, they are always trying to do what's right by the soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and, and DoD civilian. And I always enjoy my office calls with them. And frankly, I enjoy the opportunity to get in front of them in an open hearing and have an opportunity to talk about the issues that uh, we here at SOCOM uh, are dealing with. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm always pleased at how receptive they are and how supportive they are of the needs of, of everybody in the Department of Defense. Uh, but in my capacity as a SOCOM commander, they've been particularly helpful for us. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of issues right up front that I know will come up in some of the questions. Uh, so I think I can probably get them out on the table right uh, right now. Uh, the two things you've probably been hearing about are the CR, or the Continuing Resolution, and the sequester. Uh, now, a little bit of a tutorial here if I can, but the Continuing Resolution uh, basically says that as the SOCOM commander, and this is true of the service chiefs as well, that we're only allowed to spend at the fiscal year 12 levels, and we're in fiscal year 13 now. The president has already provided the fiscal year 14 budget, and in fact, we are working on a fiscal year 15 budget. But what the continuing resolution does is it restricts us to spend at the fiscal year 12 level. Well, the budget that the president had submitted, the fiscal year 13 budget, actually had a $1.5 billion increase for SOCOM. So that means that uh, based on the continuing resolution, we are actually short $1.5 billion as a result of the continuing resolution. The other problems of the continuing resolution uh, kind of hinders us with a little bit is our flexibility because some of the language in the CR means that we can't have new start programs and we had a number of programs that we were beginning 
in fiscal year 13. It also uh, restricts some of the military construction, so some of the buildings we were going to build starting in 13. We can't spend money on that. And then some modifications. Having said that, uh, I heard yesterday in my discussions with the members uh, on the Hill that uh, they are working to, uh, to pass an appropriations bill that will go along with an extension of the continuing resolution that should give us some flexibility. So we hope that uh, members on the Hill are able to resolve their differences and get that appropriate bill passed because that will certainly help us. So that's the continuing resolution. Now what you've heard about a lot is the sequestration. Sequestration really for us amounts to about 10% amounts to about of our budget. So we have a budget of $10.4 billion. That was the proposed budget for uh, FY13 uh, and for FY14 about the same, maybe a little bit more. But the fact of the matter is, uh, so we're taking about a $900 million cut to the, to the SOCOM budget. The hard part about sequestration, and this is why it has been uh, a little bit frustrating, I think, for uh, some of the members in the service, is that uh, the sequestration, one, it is a substantial amount of money, of course, coming out of the Department of Defense budget, but also uh, the cuts are taken um, kind of across the board. So we don't get an opportunity to kind of prioritize where we would take those cuts. We're, we're just told across all of our, what we call program lines, you have to take a 10% cut. So when you take Con the continuing resolution, 1.5 billion. You add to that the sequestration of 900 billion. That essentially takes away about 23 percent of our budget. Now, again, uh, we are working with members of Capitol Hill. We're working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, referred to as OSD, uh, to do the best we can to resolve these. And of course, my job as the combatant commander, as the SOCOM commander, is to make sure that the resources are appropriately applied to ensure that we've got the right forces. Uh, forward to, to be able to take care of the nation's business. Um, a couple things, though, that, uh, that are not going to be affected by sequestration or the continuing resolution. The military pays will, in fact, uh, not be cut. So any concerns uh, from members out there, their spouses, that, uh, that there might be a cut to military pay, uh, that's not part of sequestration. Uh, for the civilians that are uh, online and, and listening to this, uh, you do know that there's a furlough coming up. Uh, the furlough basically says that over the course of uh, starting in late April, I believe, right, late April till the end of September, so till 30 September, the civilians have to take about 22 days of non-paid uh, leave. Uh, so clearly that does affect our civilian base, and, uh, and we understand that that is a, a struggle for some folks, uh, but that is part of the sequestration law. Um, finally, I want to talk about, or actually two more things. I want to talk about what I can't do as the SOCOM commander. So again, if I, if I can, a little bit of a, a tutorial here. I am I'm one of nine what we refer to as combatant commanders. So you have geographic combatant commanders. So these are folks like the Central Command Commander, General Jim Mattis, uh, the Pacific Command, Admiral uh, Sam Locklear, AFRICOM, Southcom, so we have geographic areas and they are combatant commanders. And then you have Transportation Command, uh, which is one of them, uh, my, myself as SOCOM, and then Strategic Command. And we are the three what we refer to as functional combatant commanders. But as a combatant commander, there are some things that I have no oversight or no purview of. So I've seen uh, a number of the questions uh, that were provided ahead of time. And there's, there's always a lot of discussion about, you know, can you help us with daycare? Can you help improve the schools? Uh, what about the commissaries and the chapels and those sorts of service? And so I want to be clear as we go forward on this that, that I'm going to do everything I can do to help the service members and their families. But I also want to be realistic and I want to be upfront with you. And I don't want to promise you something that I can't deliver. And the fact of the matter is, uh, in some cases, they are non-appropriated funds. So for the commissaries, for example, these are non-appropriated funds. And again, I, I have no say over that. In some of the services, they are provided by uh, the, when I say the services with a small s, uh, those are provided by the individual services, the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. And, and again, I can advocate on your behalf for improvements to daycares and schools and things like that but I don't really control any of the amount of money that goes into that or the readiness of those particular areas. But again, when you have problems like that, and, and I spent uh, 
six of the, the last eight years uh, were in Fort Bragg, and I know we would work with the garrison commander there, uh, and the garrison commander would take that on as one of his responsibilities to take care of the, the school problems and the uh, commissaries and things like that. And we'd, we'd certainly encourage you to, to work through your command with the garrison commanders. Um, and uh, I guess the final point here before we start opening it up for questions is uh, I, I made a point of testifying and, and telling members of Congress that my number one priority outside of having combat ready forces is really the preservation of the force and the families. And uh, I, I think most of you here that are listening are aware that uh, a couple of years ago, my predecessor, Admiral Eric Olson, uh, did what was called the pressure on the force task force, what we call the POTIF then. And he went out and, and he and well, his team went out uh, under the auspices of uh, Chaplain Tom Soljan. And they interviewed about 7,000 service members, about 1,000 spouses, had somewhere in the neighborhood of 440 different meetings, spent about 10 months trying to take a look at the, the health of the force. Um, and Admiral Wilson, I think at the time, correctly portrayed the health of the force as being frayed. That report landed on my desk about the time I took command. And, uh, and again, recognizing where I come from, I, uh, I came into the Navy in 1977. And most of the, the folks that raised me in the military, if you will, were Vietnam veterans. And frankly, uh, we didn't do as good a job, we, the nation, didn't do as good a job as we should have in taking care of those veterans. And I watched them go through a lot of difficult times. Uh, they had problems with alcohol, with drugs, they had marital problems. Uh, the full range of problems, and there really weren't a lot of mechanisms out there at the time to help take care of them. Well, well, you need to know I'm committed to doing everything I can to ensure that that doesn't occur to this generation, your generation of young soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, spouses, DOD civilians who have given so much uh, to this nation. Uh, where I can, I want to help you solve problems uh, and make sure that we put you in a position to be healthy, to be resilient, uh, and again, to take care of your families and your spouses. So uh, one other thing, um, and I will periodically refer to uh, my notes here, so, so bear with me. Um, on the POTIF side, uh, to give you a sense of what we're trying to do here, we got together with, uh, with a lot of the family readiness groups, we got together with the uh, service components to try to find out what your needs were. And I'll be the first to tell you that we probably got it wrong. But what I didn't want to do was spend, you know, five years studying the problem and not have an opportunity to make a difference. So we, we went uh, and got together with as many people as we could, as rapidly as we could, and we tried to find out what your requirements were and what I could do legally, again, legally as a combatant commander with a limited budget. And I, I started to talk about my role. I have uh, a budget, but that budget by law is restricted to mainly taking care of the service members. Now, having said that, I have gone forward with a proposal to allow me to use some of that money to take care of the families where the services are not providing the resources necessary. But uh, in that light, uh, we were able to go out and contract for uh, a number of folks to be able to help with the, what we now call the pr preservation of the force and the families. So we've contracted for approximately 127 behavioral health uh, individuals, 350 human performance, 27 family readiness staff. So this includes folks like psychologists, social workers, nurse case managers, physical therapists, strength and conditioning coaches, and performance dietitians. And one of the arguments that I uh, presented to the Senate and the House yesterday and the, and the day before yesterday was they need to uh, help me with this, this being my ability to spend MFP 11 money. One, it's the right thing to do to help the families. But two, from the standpoint of readiness, I can make a direct linkage between the readiness of the service member and the resiliency and the health of the families. And therefore, I think we have a pretty good argument as we go forward to be able to find a, that sweet spot where it's not service money, uh, and the services are doing everything they can. And by the way, we have a great relationship with the services. I am very appreciative of the great help I'm getting from all the service chiefs. But there is, in some cases, a, a shortage. And I want to be able to put my, what we call, major force program 11 money against some of these shortfalls. And uh, 
And I will tell you that as I talk to the members up on Capitol Hill, all of them understand and appreciate the, the great uh, sacrifices that, uh, that our members and their families have been through, and they're, they are very appreciative of, of that and want to help. So with that, I probably talked uh, longer than I should have. So I think we will now go over to uh, AFSOC. As I told the members of AFSOC, it, uh, this looks like a, a scene from The View. Uh, well, I, I, I don't watch The View, I, but I have seen commercials for it. So ladies, I see you there, and Anna, I understand you might have a question for me. So fire away. Uh, I'm actually asking it from one of our other spouses that's a little under the weather today. Okay. Um, she wants to know, um, what does sequestration mean for our military families, and what will the effects be at the installation levels? Yeah, so that's a good question. That's a good question. So um, at the installation levels, what will happen is the services, all, all those that manage installations. So in your case at AFSOC, the Air Force uh, is responsible uh, for the amount of major force program, and I think in your case is major pro force program for money, that goes towards taking care of the services there at, uh, at Hurlburt. So I don't want to uh, underplay this, but clearly there will be some cuts to some of the services that are on the base there. Now the good news is, uh, as you well know, uh, AFSOC kind of runs the base. So I know General File uh, is working hard to make sure that any of those concerns are mitigated, and he'll do everything he can to ensure that the services are available. But there will be some reduction of services kind of across the board as the, the big services, in your case the Air Force, have got to figure out how they're going to meet the bill that comes from sequestration. Um, and the other area that will, uh, again, I, I don't want to uh, tell you that it's going to be disastrous because I don't think that's the case, but there will be civilians that help manage these services uh, that will be furloughed. So in some cases you will have civil servants, government servants there, that will have to take their furlough, their 22 days starting at the end of April through September. And uh, in those cases, you know, they won't show up for work because they've been told they can't do that as a result of sequestration. Now, some of the services are non-appropriated funds, or NAF as we refer to them. Those people will still be there, but the government civilians that oversee them will not. And so that will, to some degree, and I'm, I'm reluctant to say how much, but that will clearly affect uh, some of the services provided to you. Uh, does that uh, answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, ladies. Y'all look like you're all having a good time. <laughs> okay, I think we've got a video now from Stephanie and Desi. Hello, Admiral McRaven. My name is Stephanie. My name is Desi, and we are spouses with the MISOC. And our question is, how should our FRGs reflect the unique SOCOM mission? And in what ways have you seen that these FRGs are successful? Okay, great question. I'm going to pass this over to my wife. Well, <laughs> well first of all, um, each FRG, each commander and his spouse as a command team, it's their job to form their FRG for the best of their unit. So everybody, like if you compare FRGs in different places, they all may do different things, but their main goal is for the families that they have there. Um, there's quite a few things they can do to help the families. Um, I've seen lots of FRGs that have fantastic orientations to help their new personnel get used to their area and their command and any individual things there are with it. Then you have um, a lot of the FRGs put on in, um, instructional, educational things, like for instance, classes about the GI Bill, or the Thrift Savings Plan, or health care, or just um, different things to help with children. So um, the education is a big piece. Um, helping families, uh, I know that a lot of them help new spouses when they're brand new brides to help get accustomed to the military and all the things they have to do. Um, the main, one of the main things I think about FRGs are it helps the people get together and form friendships that they have for a lifetime. And there's nothing important 
more important than meeting people and making friends because then when things get difficult during deployments, then you have a group to go to and you have people to look up to, you have mentors, you have friends, and all that can help you when times get difficult. Um, a lot of the FRGs do things for pre-deployment and post-deployment. So there's a variety of things that the FRGs can do and you're right, it is unique in the soft environment because um, there are so many deployments and so much time away from home. But I think they can just be invaluable to the families uh, to help them get accustomed to everything. Does that help? They're not live, so we'll, we'll just <laughs> Oh, that's that right, they're not. Okay, well, hopefully that answered it. Okay. Okay, so let's see. We're going to go to a Facebook question next, but I'm told, you know, I always wanted to be a sportscaster. That was like my dream job. And I've already failed because they're telling me I need to look into the camera and not at the monitor. So I will start looking into the camera if I can. But let's go with a Facebook question. So fire away. What can vendors, suppliers, and contractors do to help support service members and their families during service and deployment as well as after retirement from service? Okay, so, so the question is about uh, vendors. So this is a, a pretty tricky area for us. Um, the ethics regulations are pretty clear on what any service member can or cannot accept from a vendor. And, and basically, uh, you, you really can't accept anything from a vendor because there's always the perception or the appearance that uh, by accepting something from a vendor, then, uh, then the vendor is in a position to influence you later on. So as you, as you look at what you know, vendors or contractors or other can do, others can do to help you while you're on deployment. What I'd recommend uh, to the individual that asked the question is you really need to work with your judge advocate general, your, your lawyer there at your unit, to find out what is allowable. Now, there are certain things that, uh, that can be provided, uh, but, it, but it's, a, it's a very narrow uh, area that, uh, that vendors can help with. Uh, so again, I, I'd refer you to your to your JAG or your your local lawyer on that one. Okay, we're going live again here, I guess. So AFSOC. Oh no, uh, we went to AFSOC. Was I? Oh, I'm sorry, Joette and Erica. My my mistake. So, okay, over to Naval <laughs> Special Warfare. Did I get that one? Yes. How am I doing? Okay, Joette, you're up. It's good. We have a question from Erica Carrington here today. Hi, sir. Um, I understand and appreciate the return to six-month deployments and the concept of heads on pillows in relation to improving purse tempo. Is there any visibility into the unintended consequences, such as the increased disruption to family schedules due to the unpredictability and often extended hours of local training routines? Yeah, that's a great question, Erica. So, uh, again, for the broader audience here, um, I have... Uh, gotten together with the, uh, my component commander. So uh, the way it works in SOCOM is the SOCOM commander underneath me, I have got service components. So USASOC, uh, the United States Army Special Operations Command, Marine Special Operations Command, Naval Special Warfare, where Erica and Joad are at, uh, the Joint Special Operations Command, and the Air Force Special Operations Command. And so they are my service components, if you will. But they are also the folks that provide uh, the the service members that deploy downrange. So for, for those of you that have been living this for a long time, you know that many of your uh, spouses have been downrange for uh, a year, 12 months, 15 months, eight months. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, when I took a look at this report I talked about that Admiral Olson did for me, uh, a lot of it had to do with, one, unpredictable deployments, but also the length of the deployments. So I have directed my service components to reduce the deployment time overseas for the tactical units. And I want to be a little bit careful here because some of the staff elements that go over in the headquarters will still be longer than a six-month deployment. But all of the tactical elements, so, you know, at the ODA level, the SEAL task unit level, the MSOT level, uh, the AFSOC, uh, if you're going over as part of the JASOAC, all of those uh, are being reduced to six months. Now, that won't all start tomorrow. Uh, there is a, a progression we have to have to get them to the, the six month time frame, but, but most of them are getting there pretty quick, which I'm, I'm pleased to see. So there's a, another piece of this, Erica, which is the, the, the total time deployed. 
So we, we took a look at ensuring, one, that we're not hurting the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, SEALs in terms of schools they need to go to, things that they have to get done for their uh, professional development and their advancement. And we took a look at really the training that was needed. And we have implemented a policy, I have implemented a policy that says that they have to be home a minimum, and this is the minimum, of 34% of the time over a two-year period of time. So this really gets down to making sure that that is their head on the pillow. Now, it still seems like a lot of time away from home, but that is, in fact, the minimum. I will tell you that as I look at some of the other units, some of them are up to the high 40s in terms of their amount of time home. But what I didn't want to do, because it really is the responsibility of, you know, in your case, uh, WARCOM or Naval Special Warfare Group 1 or Group 2, and the subsequent SEAL teams and special boat teams to be able to manage their force. So sometimes I gotta, you know, keep them from, from hurting themselves by directing certain things, but I also wanna give them enough flexibility and enough latitude to, to manage their personnel appropriately so they're providing uh, ready forces downrange. The other thing we're coming up with is what's called Defense Ready. Defense Ready is a program, a, a, a software program that will now allow us to know down to the individual level every time a guy goes away from home. So in the past, we have had some of these programs, uh, software programs. Some of them have been better than others. Uh, we went out and did the market research. A number of the components are already using Defense Ready, and they have told us, hey, this is a great program for the commanders and the senior enlisted to be able to very quickly look and say, okay, where is Erica's husband? How much time has he spent? you know, away from home, what exactly is he doing, all those sorts of things so that, frankly, we do a better job of managing the time away. And when we see somebody coming close to the red line, then we can back them off so that we're not uh, creating undue pressure on, on the individual or the families. Now, you know the guys. You know, the guys are going to want to deploy every opportunity they can. The guys are going to want to go to every cool school out there. But the reality of the matter is my job is to save them from themselves and to say, look, guys, you got to spend more time at home because I don't want to break the families and I'll have this great, you know, SEAL or special boat or ODA or MSOT only to find out that I've got a broken family at home. So this is clearly a part of where we've got to get to make sure that the force, and when I refer to the force, this is not just the members, this is the members and their families are, are healthy, resilient, and uh, again, because it's morally the right thing to do. Does that uh, help there, Erica? Yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's see. I'm looking at my big board here. So am I going to AFSOC? To Anna. To Anna at AFSOC. Are we back? Y'all are back. We're back. <laughs> All right. Um, you answered part of my question already, sir, but I'm just going to ask it to the way it's in front of me. Um, it says, I've heard that there's possibly a 20% pay cut to our airmen salaries. If this is true, what services on base are going to try to help the family still get the goods and services that they need on the budgets that they will have. Yeah, so uh, there will be no cut to salaries. Uh, so if there is word out there on the street that that's the case, uh, there's nothing about sequestration or anything that's talking about cut to salaries. Uh, now, uh, you know, truth in lending here, as the services go forth over the course of, you know, the next, I don't know, five or ten years, uh, and new members become, begin to come in, uh, you know, we will have to look at these new kids coming in. Do they get the same entitlements that uh, we get as service members now? Uh, I don't know whether or not the U.S. government will be able to fully afford the sort of entitlements that we get now as service members. Uh, and as you well know, our, uh, when I say entitlements, that, that sounds uh, like a derogatory term, but it is, you know, the health care we get, the retirement benefits we get, uh, they are, they're pretty healthy and, and pretty impressive, and, and we should all feel fortunate that the U.S. government has, has taken care of us as well as they have. The question is, can the U.S. government continue to afford to do that? And I think as, uh, as the services and as, you know, Capitol Hill and the, and the president and others look at this in the future, in the future, then, you know, some hard decisions are going to have to be made on whether or not we can fully afford to provide the new guys coming in uh, the same benefits we got. But for right now, there there is no anticipated cut in any of the airmen's uh, salaries. Okay. So I got a video from Caitlin. 
Hello, my name is Caitlin, and my husband is currently serving JSOC here at Fort Bragg. Many people have asked what we can do to help support our civilian workers as they start to be affected by sequestration. What are the regulations um, concerning using gift cards and gift certificates of monetary value for um, door prizes and raffles, things of that nature, if they are going specifically to some of our impacted civilian workers? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, again, the as was kind of brought up a little bit earlier, the the law and it is the law regarding uh, what we can do in terms of providing uh, support for civilians or receiving support from other contractors is pretty specific. So, in the case of providing gift cards, if you as an individual, uh, if if Caitlin, you decide you want to give a gift card to one of your great civilian employees that's there then you're absolutely within your rights to do that. However, units are not allowed to have raffles in order to raise money to support government officials even if they're on furlough. So the, the, both the law and the policy is pretty clear. Uh, and and I, I know from my time at JSOC, uh, we looked at, at possibilities of doing that. Uh, and, and frankly, it, it's just in some ways not feasible. Now, let me, I will caveat that a little bit. The FRG, I think, has some latitude depending upon the state you're in. So I'd have to, again, go back to the lawyers and ask them in North Carolina what, what state regulations are for what the FRG can do. And there, there are state-by-state -state regulations that, uh, uh, that deal with what can be provided. So one, uh, we as a government institution can't conduct raffles in order to provide money or benefits to other government employees or, or anybody for that matter. Um, but institutions that are separate from us to some degree like an FRG or if there are other uh, entities out there, uh, they have other rules that govern them and you'll just have to kind of get back with the, uh, with the lawyers. Okay. Rachel. Hi, sir. Um, MARSOC does a great job of engaging families and creating a sense of community. However, um, the command currently can only utilize the funding received for their Perez program for active duty service members. Uh, without a waiver in place to be able to use that funding toward family programs, how can MARSOC fund programs that contribute to decreasing the pressure on force and family? Yeah, thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so uh, there's a couple things that, uh, that MARSOC can do. Um, on a space available basis, uh, the family members are certainly welcome to come in and talk to the folks that run the Perez. And for, for the broader audience, the Perez uh, are, are MARSOC's kind of human performance uh, program. Uh, that's their, their uh, marine name for it. Um, so on a space available basis, family members can come in and take advantage of the great support they get from the Perez. As I mentioned uh, it, uh, earlier in the discussion here, one of the things I am trying to do is figure out to how can I legally use my major force program $11 to be able to supplement, and that's the key word, to supplement where the services or the existing policy doesn't allow me to support it. So. Uh, Perez is a good example, but frankly, it, it's across the board. Uh, I'll give you a, a case in point. Uh, when we were out in San Diego, a uh, great discussion with one of the spouses, and she said, you know, uh, my husband gets uh, taken care of very well. They got, we have the human performance program out here. Uh, he's got, you know, nutritionists, and he's got sports medicine folks. Um, but for me to see a nutritionist uh, is very difficult, and yet, you know, when, when their husband is on deployment, frankly, the availability of the, the social workers and the nutritionists and, and the physical therapists, we need to figure out a way where the wives can take advantage of those folks uh, without unduly impacting on, on their support to their service members. So this is really the, the sweet spot I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to figure out what can I legally do, because right now there are some legal restrictions, uh, but then there are also some areas where the MARSOC commander, uh, General Clark, and the, the battalion commanders can take advantage of some of the space available time to help with the, the families with the Perez program in your case. But that applies across the board. So wherever there is space available time, 
uh, family members can can tap into the human performance programs across the the SOCOM enterprise. Does that uh, help, Rachel? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Are there going to be more strong bonds training events in the future? With the current op tempo, they're extremely valuable to the soldiers and the families. Well, thank you, Bethany. Uh, I will tell you, when, when I've traveled around uh, the Strong Bonds Program, the Army Strong Bonds Program, uh, everywhere I go, I hear about the benefits of Strong Bonds. And I have had a number of discussions with uh, General Ray Odierno, who is the Chief of Staff of the Army. Uh, uh, also, his uh, chaplain, the Army Chaplain, uh, uh, Chaplain Rutherford, who is an old friend of ours, uh, Don Rutherford. Uh, we have talked to them about the Army Strong Bonds program, and I will tell you, General Odierno is absolutely committed to making sure that uh, the Strong Bonds program, you know, stays in place as much as it can. Now, again, I don't want to mislead anybody out here. There are going to be some cuts to services, but the Strong Bonds program, where the service can't provide it, and this is true of Strong Bonds and other service programs, then, then again, my intent is to find out what that gap looks like and where I can help out, I intend to do that. But, but it also gets back to the advocacy role. So as I mentioned earlier, while there's some things I have no control over, so I have no control over the commissaries and daycares and schools and chapels and those sorts of things, I certainly have the ability to come in and advocate for our soft service members with the service chiefs. And I do that routinely. But candidly, the service chiefs are just as committed as I am to making sure that we're taking care of their service members and their families. Um, and uh, and I, I, I mentioned earlier, I had the commanding officers, the new commanding officers, what's called a pre-command course, uh, down at our Joint Special Operations University earlier today, uh, along with uh, a number of the sergeant majors and command chiefs. And these are the you know, 05, 06 level, and the sergeant majors and master chiefs uh, uh, that are there. And I had the opportunity to tell them very candidly about the quality of leadership uh, in their respective services. And I know all the service chiefs exceedingly well. And these are not only great leaders, these are just wonderful human beings. And from General Dempsey, who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Admiral Winnefeld, who is the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the service chiefs and the service senior enlisted, fabulous people. And, and I will tell you, as an American citizen, and I think George Ann knows you know, all the wives of these guys, she'd tell you the same thing, that the wives are terrific. We're just blessed, frankly, to have this kind of leadership at the senior level, and, and for me to have an opportunity to engage with them is always a pleasure. And they're just, again, wonderful, honorable, great human beings. So uh, I know as we look at Strong Bonds programs and other programs, the service chiefs, everywhere they can, they are going to take care of their, their service members to the best of, uh, of their ability. Okay, so I'm, I'm live again. Ladies. <laughs> Hi, sir. <laughs> um, I, this question is actually from uh, another uh, woman who couldn't be here today, and it's actually a three-part question. Do you want me to uh -oh. just ask all three questions together, or do you want me to give you a break to answer oh, each Oh, gosh, one? no. You know, my memory's not that good, Brooke, so fire away one question at a time. Let me see what I can do. Okay. She says, my questions are about health care. On-base providers are already oversaturated with active duty members that family members are encouraged to go to an off-base provider. Access to care seems to be getting worse, not better. What's being done to fix this as well as the quality of care? Without sick call, you have to make an appointment for an acute illness, such as a head cold, and that can take up to two weeks to be seen. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, Brooke, I'd like to tell you that I've got a good answer for you on this one, but I'm not sure I do. Uh, I mean, this is a continuing problem, and, and I may ask George Ann to jump in here because you know, she certainly had to deal with it in, in my time away. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, I, I still think we, we, the military, probably have the best health care program of any government agency. And while there are always concerns about TRICARE and what TRICARE can provide to uh, members and the difficulties of the TRICARE program, uh, it, it's really pretty good. And when you, when you retire that TRICARE program, uh, remains in some venue still for you. But there's no question about it, uh, there is a demand on the system. Uh, so our time at Fort Bragg 
uh, you know, when we looked at Womack, which is the main hospital there on Fort Bragg, uh, a lot of times the spouses could not get in or the waiting list was so long just because the service members, it's a very large base, the service members were coming in and, and the purpose of the hospital was first and foremost to take care of the service members. So it is a difficult problem, but this is one really where I think, uh, you know, general file or the wing commander, you really kind of have to get together with the base commander there uh, and, the, and the hospital commander, and this is again true across the board. And you have to sit down with them and talk to them about how do you, how do you find, you know, better time frames to be able to deal with families. When we were at JSOC, we ended up establishing a JSOC clinic at Womack uh, specifically to take care of the JSOC folks because frankly the uh, Womack, great doctors, great support, but they were just overtaxed. And we put a physician's assistant out there and, and that PA became the most popular guy in all of JSOC because uh, in this case, I mean the PA, we actually got two PAs, they would see the family members and really that was kind of their job was to you know, get the family members in the door and where they couldn't specifically take care of them, they could direct them towards somebody within the clinic. Uh, so this is a long way of saying uh, this is indeed a problem. Uh, and, and it is an area where I said, I don't have a good answer because it really is about how the medical wings, you know, we've got a great medical wing here at, uh, uh, at McDill, but they are overtaxed as well. So every area, when you have a problem like that, you really kind of have to get together with the garrison commander and see what kind of accommodations you can come to. But, but is the problem also that um, the providers off base aren't taking TRICARE? Is that part of the problem? I don't think that is as much of a problem. Oh, okay. I, I haven't had that experience. In this particular circumstance, I, I do happen to know the girl asking this question personally. And I know when it comes to specialists, it's very difficult to find them in our area. Right. Um, I, I know I've been referred off base for ur acute care before to urgent care, and then you have to go through the process of getting a, a, referral. a referral. They right. won't see you without it. it. It's challenging. But the off base providers are wonderful about taking child care. Um, oh, I'm, good. I'm, I'm good. Deal with that with, my daughter, okay. uh, with some issues she's had. So it's not that the off base people are not helping, it's just our clinic itself is just so just right. yeah. saturated with, with people. Well, can they look at getting PAs like you did in other places? Well, I mean, well this is, again, one of the things uh, as we move forward, as I mentioned, you know, there are going to be in some cases not, you know, again, we, we can't provide, I can't provide legally medical support. So we have folks that are um, uh, health care providers, if you will, nurse case managers and mm -hmm. nutritionists yeah. and things like that, but, but I'm not in a position to fund additional people for the clinics. Uh, now again, the, the physician's assistant that we got from JSOC, I worked through the service to provide me a, a PA there. But uh, let me go back though real quick to the issue of, uh, of TRICARE off base because it's good to hear that, uh, yeah. that there in Herbert you're having good success with TRICARE off base. You know, that's clearly not the case uh, in a lot of other places and, and George Ann and I have, have lived this problem in you know, the in other places, yeah, but, but, other that, places. but that's good at least that you have that. But, um, but when you have a sick child, you don't want to have to be calling around. So, but on the here's what I would offer you though for those uh, you know, listen on the net where you're having trouble with, with uh, healthcare providers accepting TRICARE off base. Uh, because again, I've run into this before, and we were very fortunate at, at Fort Bragg, the 18th Airborne Commander, who actually on Fort Bragg is kind of the mayor, if you will. I'm not sure if that's changed with Forcecom there. But, uh, but he became very engaged with uh, the civilian population off base. And he said, hey, look, you know, we need more of you, you know, dentists and doctors to start taking TRICARE. And of course, they come back and they say, hey, you know, it's not really uh, a good business move for us. And the comeback is, I got it. Understand it may not be the best business move for you, but it's what's good for the community. And oh, by the way, you know, the better you are for the community, the more likely your business will increase. And, and that worked to some degree. So I think is, uh, again, a lot of these problems, sometimes you just have to get a mass of, of, uh, of folks, you know, they're on the base and you've got, the, got to get the base or the post leadership to kind of move out into the civilian community and say, we need your help here. Great to hear it uh, uh, off base there at Herbert that they're taking good care of you. Okay, fire on with question number two. Okay. <laughs> All uh, pharmacies on base seem to be carrying less and less of commonly prescribed medications, forcing us to go off base to get the medications filled. 
right here just almost doubled the prescription co-pays, and it seems that one of our most important benefits is being eroded. What, if anything, is being done to fix this? Yeah, well, I will tell you, that that's one, Brooke, I don't have an answer for you on, and, and instead of tap dancing, uh, so run that by me again. So it's the it's the co-payments on the uh, on the meds, right? Yes, and a lot of them are not. I think being run off the formulary at the MTX. They don't okay. they don't have them in our pharmacy where you can get it for free, but then you have to go off base okay. and you have to pay your copay, and the copays have gone up. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me get back to you on that one uh, because, I, like I said, I'd I'd be tap dancing here if I tried to answer that one for you. Okay. The third question is also copays. Okay. Uh, she also heard that there's a possibility that they'll have a copay for that we will have a copay for Tricare when we go to the clinic. If this is true, how much will it be, and what happens if we don't have the money for the copay? Will we still be able to get care? Yeah. Okay. We'll have to get back to yeah. that too. I don't. I we don't know about that either. Yeah. But okay. you'll get back to him on that. Absolutely. Okay. If she tells me I'm going to get back to you, I'm going to get back to you. Okay. Thanks, Brooke. Okay, question Facebook from Misty, all right? Thank you for this opportunity. As a senior spouse and a parent of a military member, my concern not only lies with taking care of the men who have put off medical treatment in order to get in one more deployment, but how our community can prevent the younger guys from pushing their bodies and minds so far that they end up in their dad's shoes. Can these young warriors be tested for TBI in a timely fashion? Football players are being made to sit out when they get a concussion. Is there a way to test the men after an op or at the very least a deployment and if they do have a concussion have them rest for a period of time? I understand that war is not a football game but preserving the health of these men is not only cost effective it is right. I am also wondering if there has been any talk of giving the Purple Heart to warriors diagnosed with TBI. My husband doesn't care about that but as a wife I believe they deserve to have recognition of their wounds. I think it is more important for the families than the men. Lastly, how are these warriors' diagnoses being protected? With all the gun debate, I am concerned our men will be labeled by this administration as not fit to own a firearm. Thank you for your time. Okay, well, thank you very much, Misty. Uh, let me uh, kind of, you had a, about a three-part question here, so let me see what I can do to answer them. One, on the, on the firearms, uh, you know, medical information is protected. So uh, my expectation is anybody that is found to have TBI or frankly any any medical uh, problem, that information is not going to be releasable to the public that puts that person in, in a point where they're not allowed to, to buy uh, a firearm and exercise their constitutional rights. Uh, on the Purple Heart, you know, this was an interesting one because uh, George Ann and I were, uh, were talking about this last night as we were reviewing some of the questions. You know, clearly if somebody has been in a, an IED uh, where uh, the blast, in fact, uh, renders them, you know, seriously unconscious uh, and, and, it, and it is clear as a result of enemy action, because that's really what drives a Purple Heart. As a result of enemy action, they have TBI, then I think there is some merit, and I, I don't want to go too far out on a limb here, but I think there is some merit for an individual getting a Purple Heart. Now, uh, I will tell you, we have a number of folks, because I was just with one last week, or actually earlier this week, who has TBI that was not as a result of enemy action, but was as a result of the fact that he was a breacher. And a breacher is, in our community, a, a guy that blows doors down and does other things. And what the doctors told him, it was, it was very minor TBI, but it was still TBI, was that the, the kind of constant trauma from the breaching is probably what caused uh, his mild TBI. So I think what we would have to look at before a Purple Heart is uh, awarded is the nature of the incident that led to the TBI. Um, getting back to your, your kind of broader uh, discussion on kind of TBIs in, in general, and I think this is a great question first. Um, you know, one of the things we do every time guys come off the battlefield is uh, and certainly if there has been something that even appears to be a traumatic event that might cause a TBI is they, they're required to take kind of a test that kind of walks them through, okay, did this happen, did this happen, did this happen, and a medical uh, professional will look at that test to determine what is the likelihood that the individual has TBI or received a concussion. 
So while it's not like the guy on the football field, um, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to understate this. If somebody has an event where they think that there was a concussion, I guarantee you when he comes back, the docs are going to look at him and they'll do everything that happens to a, just like a football player does when he gets a neurological exam from a doctor. But there are other methods I think that NFL teams use on the sideline to very kind of quickly determine uh, concussions other than just the doc looking at them. But one of the things we do as well is what's called uh, third location decompression. And third location decompression is something that we're trying to institute uh, with all of the returning units. Now, I will tell you, it gets mixed reviews from some of the, the spouses uh, because you say, hey, look, we're going to take your, uh, your spouse and on their way home from combat, we're going to send them to some place for 48, 72 hours, and we're going to have them just kind of chill out. And, oh, by the way, they're going to spend time with the doc, the psychologist, and the chaplain. And we're going to take a look to see whether or not that individual has any cases of TBI or PTSD beginning, and we do what we call the neck-up checkup. So somebody sits down with them. They're required to do that for 20 minutes per individual longer if required, to get a sense of whether or not that individual is kind of uh, got any problems as a result of the, their deployment uh, to, in this case, to Afghanistan in most cases. So I think we're doing uh, a reasonably good job of looking at those things, but also where we need your help as a spouse. I mean, we, we really do need your help, and it's one of the things that I talk to the, uh, all of the commanders about today is to make sure that we destigmatize anything that has to do with TBI, PTSD, any sort of, you know, you know, spiritual or mental problems, we've got to get the individuals to come forward. And I would ask you as spouses, if you see that your husband or wife has a problem, do the right thing. Come forward. Talk to somebody. We will take care of them. We're not going to pull their clearance. You know, we're not going to put them away. We're going to do everything we can to take care of them. And if I find out that the leadership within Special Operations Command is not taking care of a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine, I will personally do something about it. And I made that point very clear to the commanders and the senior enlisted that were with us. But I need the guys to come forward. What I told the commanders is create an environment so that they are willing to come forward. Uh, I think many of you know my command sergeant major and his wife, Lisa, uh, have been on the road quite a bit in my CSM and his wife talking about kind of their marital problems and what uh, Chris and Lisa have been through. That has been very, very good for, you know, creating an environment where he has been able to say, look, in this case, the Admiral understood I had a lot of problems uh, when I was uh, at Delta, and, and he brought me to JSOC, and when I was at JSOC, he brought me to SOCOM. The reason I did that, he's one of the absolute finest men I've ever been around, and clearly one of the finest uh, command sergeant majors I've ever had work for me. Uh, so the fact of the matter is, I got it, he's got issues, but let me tell you, come forward, deal with those issues, and I will take, you know, guys with issues that perform well any day. So the point is, you know, help us help you by bringing your husband or wife forward if they've got a problem. I think this, the systems are in place to deal with them if they're coming back from deployment, but if you think that's not the case, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got a video here. Hi, Admiral McCraven. My name is Deirdre and my mom is Connie. Thank you for helping us Gold Star families. My mom and I have this question for you, Mrs. McCraven. What is being done to help some of us Gold Star families? For example, my mom and some other Gold Star wives could really use some help with fixing things that have been broken around our house. When my dad was here, he fixed everything and even wanted to rebuild the house. My mom and I don't know how to fix things and just need someone to come by and show us how to do small projects, like fixing broken doorknobs, fixing a glass door that doesn't lock, and helping us pull up carpet, this kind of thing. Thank you for this opportunity, sir. The FRG is a really neat idea. Well, let me, real quick before Georgianne answers that, and then I'll, I'll let her chime in here. But first, dear, let me, uh, again, send my condolences. Uh, Obviously aware of your your father's death, uh, and uh, and again I, I know George and I speak for George and we say we're, our our thoughts and prayers are with you. Um, we had a George and host uh, Gold Star 
wives here periodically, and we had one not too long ago who had an issue with moving into her house, and you know, we asked for volunteers, and they, they came out of the woodwork to help her. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, some of this has to do with uh, you know, tapping into the, uh, the folks that are part of your support network, even if you've left the military, uh, to see what they can do on a voluntary basis to help. But let me. Uh, well, and that's first of all, I am I'm very sorry for your loss, and um, there are people that want to help. And I think um, every unit that's had a loss, if they found if they find out about these things, I know there are volunteers out there to help. So I guess what we have to do is make sure that we know that you know we know when people have problems because we can find people just to go over and help with those things. I know, I know how you feel. I can't do any of that either. So, um, so I think we can talk to the CARE Coalition or someone about organizing volunteers at the different units. Is that yeah, okay? No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, Deirdre, as I understand in your case, uh, you're not near uh, a local military unit. And, and this, uh, again, there's... But, but I still think the CARE Coalition could find volunteers in those areas. Uh, absolutely. Yes. And so, again, this, is, this gets back to making sure that people in your area, again, if you're not near a military installation, mm -hmm. which my understanding is you're not, uh, then, you know, I think there are other benevolent organizations that would be willing to find somebody that can kind of help you and take care of those uh, sliding glass doors and those windows mm -hmm. and those sorts of things. Uh, and, and, you know, there are people out there, great Americans that want to help. They just need to know that, that you need that assistance. There isn't, uh, well, I mean, again, this is about tapping into the, uh, the great folks out there that want to help you, and, and we'll certainly help you do that, Deirdre. Thanks. Uh, we're going to continue on here because I, Dano, can I continue to, okay. We were going to stop at uh, 2.30 Eastern Standard Time. I see I've got some more questions here, and I don't want to shortchange anyone. So let's, uh, we'll keep going uh, for another few minutes here. So, Yusasak. Good afternoon. Oh, <laughs> Good afternoon. Huh? Good afternoon. My question is regarding the drawdown. Okay. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about the number of troops, soft troops, that will be left in Afghanistan past 2014. Yeah, well, that, that is a, uh, you know, a question that has been... Uh, you know, worked over right now. So let me tell you what I can tell you and, and some of what I think is going to happen. So the president has already, has already given us a number for the end of 2013. Uh, we're going to draw down to 34,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan actually by February of 2014 is the timeline on that. And then you'll have commensurate with that, you'll have a, a group of NATO soldiers. So if we've got 34,000, there's an expectation that NATO will have somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000. Then as you look at drawing towards the end of 2014, uh, that decision has not been made yet in terms of what's the size of the force that's going to be left in Afghanistan, or, or even the size of the force that will take us to December of 14. So we don't know what that uh, number looks like yet, but my expectation is within the next several months, uh, the president will make a decision uh, on what uh, what that number ought to be, and then 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 really it's uh, understanding kind of the velocity and the requirements for us in the soft world. Here's what I think is going to happen, um, and, and I want to make sure that I caveat this. Uh, this is just my uh, you know my opinion, and, and again nothing that's driving it yet. But there will be a need through 2014, so towards the end of 2014, for us in the special operations community to continue to do the counterterrorism role and to continue to advise, train, and assist the Afghans. And, and certainly there at USASOC, you know, uh, the Great Green Berets and the military information support teams and the SIMCs, the civil military support elements that are out there, and the Army helicopter pilots, and all that USASOC provides is doing a magnificent job of building the Afghan local police. Uh, and we're up to like 19,000 Afghan local police growing at some point in time to about 45,000. Uh, they're building the Afghan commandos, the Afghan special forces. Um, so there will always be a role for the USASOC soldier through the end of 2014 to continue to do that advising and assisting. Uh, and then our, some of our other forces, of course, are doing the more kinetic operations and the counterterrorism operations. 
So that'll go till 2014. What I don't know, and what I can't tell you, is what we're, we're referring to as an enduring presence. I don't know whether or not we will even have an enduring presence. That remains to be seen. That, those discussions will occur between uh, President Obama, President Karzai, and uh, Secretary General Rasmussen from, um, uh, from NATO. So they will have to have those discussions to determine whether or not um, you know, there's going to be an enduring presence. So I know it's not a very satisfying answer in terms of what is our force going to look like. Uh, what I will tell you is it is going to be less than it is today. And that's important because we have other demands out there. Uh, I also want to get our, our operational tempo back to the point where it's at a one to two at a minimum so that your husband is not constantly deploying so that we can kind of get him back and make sure that his dwell time back in Fort Bragg is appropriate. So we will clearly see a reduction in special operations forces in Afghanistan over the next year. So some of the guys will be coming back. What will be left at the end, uh, I don't know yet. I don't think we'll know for, for several months. Does that help? They turned my mic on. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria. Okay, Victoria, I can't hear you if you're talking. If you can hear me, you're going to have to unmute your microphone on that end. No. Okay. Yeah, Victoria, she's taking charge there. She's getting people moving. Okay. One, five. Sounds like <laughs> movie. Okay, I tell you what we're going to do, Victoria. We're going to move on, and then we'll come back. I'll have the technicians off to the side here, see if we can figure out how to get your video, your audio up. So we're going to go to to a video from Jean. So Jean, go ahead. Hi, I've heard that there's embedded social workers now at Fort Bragg. Uh, they they call it embedded behavioral health care workers, and I'm really excited because my husband and I have really been wanting some couples counseling, but now we're told we have to wait until they're set up in clinics, which is kind of like what already exists on Fort Bragg, and we're kind of concerned about security clearance, uh, confidentiality. Um, my husband's really, really private, and, and we, we, we'd like to be able to work with somebody, but without it all being documented. So I'd like to know what's happening with this, this new embedded Health social thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gene. So uh, I'm trying to see if I've got the number of social workers, but this was, uh, uh, you know, this was a big issue. And, and I will tell you from, again, my time at uh, JSOC, we had a, a magnificent social worker there, and she was frankly one of the busiest folks we had in the, in the headquarters. Uh, and, and I found, you know, the value of the social worker uh, you know, my expectation of what a social worker did and really what our social worker did were two different things. And she was fabulous, you know, marriage counseling, all those sorts of things that uh, the gene you laid out. So uh, the reason you probably haven't seen them yet is because we, we just let this contract. So the social workers and all the other behavioral health specialists are just now beginning to kind of come into the various units. So there will be a little bit of a lag time, if you will, They've got to find office spaces, uh, but, but there won't be any intent to create uh, barriers around your access to them. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons our social worker was so successful is because, as the, the JSOC folks know there, uh, the annex is kind of off the compound so that people could kind of freely come in, and, and that was crucial. So one of the things that I have recommended to all the units is put your social workers and others in a position where you'll have free access without having to go through a lot of security checks. Now, in terms of you know documentation and the privacy, again, that is become between you and the social worker. Uh, the social worker has, uh, again, she is governed by certain, or the, so, the social worker is governed by certain policies and, and rules and laws uh, that your confidentiality is protected. So I don't think you have to worry about uh, the privacy issue when it comes to you and your husband uh, talking to a social worker. Uh, what I'd ask you is give us a little bit of time because, 
Yep. Well, I was going to say the POTIF rep at your um, um, husband's command would know when the people are in place. That's a good point. Yeah. Yes. And so you could check with them because they will know uh, the status of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're going to... That's going to, we're going to try JSOC again. Okay. Can you hear me? I can yes. hear you. Can hear you. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria from JSOC. We're connected. My question is related to operational security. Okay. It's exciting to see recognition in the media and movies of the great work our military members are doing, but at the same time, it's concerning. Is this something we should be worried about? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, Victoria. I get asked that question a lot. And, uh, and I don't want to dismiss uh, the operational security concerns. Uh, where I get frustrated, and I, I've been very clear, I said, look, I don't have anything against books or movies or television shows. Uh, I tell people the reason I came into special operations was because I saw the movie The Green Beret with John Wayne. And my sister happened to be dating a Green Beret. And, and he, when he found out I was going into the Navy, he said, hey, you ought to go be a Navy SEAL. So I always tell folks it was an Army Green Beret that convinced me to be a Navy SEAL. But, you know, so the movies that are out there, the books, and, and, you know, all of us in the military have read books of great, you know, heroism and leadership. So I think these are very important. And I want to be, I want to ensure that what I don't do is tell people, hey, don't write books or don't do movies. No, I think it's okay to do that. However, what you have to do is follow the procedure. So where I have been frustrated lately is a number of these guys that have written books um, have, in fact, not followed the procedure. And what that does then is it puts us in kind of this awkward position of saying, hey, oh, by the way, you signed a non-disclosure statement, a couple of them in many cases, which said that you weren't going to divulge tactics, techniques, and procedures, but in fact, you just wrote a book that did. Now, you know, if they had come to us, we, we probably would have said, look, there's some areas here that we're not comfortable with and we wouldn't recommend you doing, but we're not going to stop you from doing it. Because if you want to tell the story about, you know, great heroic acts in Iraq or Afghanistan, as long as you're not compromising security, and I think you can do that without compromising security, then, then go forward and, and do it because I think, again, a lot of these times it tells a good story. I have not seen any case yet where these books or movies have really put any individuals at risk. Now, again, I don't want to understate the concern. You know, all of your units have got uh, folks that keep an eye out, you know, our, our counterintelligence folks uh, that keep an eye out for what's happening vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the bad guys looking into the units. And so we have people that are looking out for your safety, uh, kind of constantly sensing what's going on out there to make sure that we're keeping you protected. So I think as long as people follow the rules and the regulations, it gives us an opportunity to kind of protect what is really, no kidding, operationally important uh, and not put people at risk. And then at the same time, those units that are doing classified operations, we do have people at those units that, that hopefully are doing their job and making sure that we're keeping you protected. Does, does that uh, help? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Are you there at the uh, annex? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do you see the app again? Yeah. 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 I think George Ann spent half the time there at the yeah. annex. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'm following the big board here. So I guess we're going to go to another question from JSOC, please. Nicole. Nicole? Nicole. All right. Hi, I'm Nicole from JSOC, like you said. Um, and this question is from Dyla, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but says hi. Um, she says, This is a question for George Ann. You seem to have raised such successful, positive children. I look to you as a military spouse who did it. As my children, her children, are getting older, <laughs> i.e. teenagers, uh, and finding it very difficult at times to be mom and dad while dad is away, do you have any suggestions or experiences that you can share to help raise well-adjusted children? Well, hello. Well, hello. First hello. of all, hi. Hello. And, and, and please tell Dyla hello for me. I miss her. Um, well, there's, there's quite a few things. Um, like I said when I talked about FRGs before, I think when you get to a new place and you get involved and start volunteering and you make friends, 
nothing helps you more when you're on your own and your husband's away and you've got your children if you have friends to do things with. Um, my children, um, we did, I, we did spend a lot of time without uh, my husband, but we always, um, when he was home and even when he wasn't home, we always did a lot as a family. And I think um, you have wonderful places there at Fort Bragg to get outside and do things together as a family. Um, and we always really stress that, which helped a lot with our multiple moves because lots of times you'd move someplace new and you wouldn't have anybody else but your family with you. And if you learn to have a lot of fun together as a family, it just makes everything wonderful and um, holidays, everything, even if you're by yourselves, if you have each other at work. So anyway, that was a big thing we did. When my husband was there, we were together with him, but when he wasn't, we just always, our family unit was most important. Secondly, I think, um, now I know a lot of people homeschool, so this wouldn't count for them, but um, I always would try and get really involved in the schools that kids were in, either on the PTA or something, just so I always knew what was going on in their lives and at the schools and could be, um, stay involved. And um, then with sports and that with, with homeschoolers, that you can definitely do that. We got very involved with lots of sports. You know, my kids did, um, from the time they were little, they did sports of every kind. So it didn't matter. You didn't have to, when you're young, you don't have to make teams. Everyone can do it. And that was one of our big family events was going to watch, you know, they'd watch their brothers and sisters do everything together. So I think the more you can do as a family and get outside and be active, and involve um, the other people in your unit. Um, I miss JSOC and all the, the parties and the children's programs we used to have because we would get together and ever, we'd know each other's children and um, it's just a great way to spend time together. So I, I don't know, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, I miss oh, you guys. I miss you guys. Uh, we miss you. Miss you. Miss you. <laughs> you Sasak. Hi, my name is Carolyn. Um, thank you for doing this town hall, and thank you, um, Georgia Ann, for being a part of part of it. Um, and actually, you already answered my question. My question was about the strong bonds training, and it sounds like you're on board to keep that going. So we're happy about that. Thank you. Thanks. What I what I need to know though is, uh, and, and our folks here will help uh, track it as well, but. As I said, uh, you know there will be some cuts coming. But if you get to the point where you sense that there's a dramatic downturn in the strong bonds support to USASOC and to the other units that are there in Fort Bragg, please let General Cleveland know, and and uh, and he'll let me know because I, I again, and then I can let frankly the chief of staff of the Army know those sorts of things. And, and and this is true for all the units out there. If you really begin to sense that some of these cuts are having an undue effect on your families or your readiness, please let me know. Um, some of it, you know, there is a little bit of uh, concern that m we may find out is unfounded. I, I don't know yet. Uh, and this is, this, there's still some uh, uncertainty out there about what is sequestration, how is it really going to affect the services on the post, on the base, those sorts of things. So, I don't think we fully know yet, but I think as the year goes on, and certainly within the next two years, we'll have a much better appreciation for the effects these are having. And then I need all you uh, ladies and, and service members out there and, uh, and folks to help me understand what the problem is so I can do what I can to, to fix it. Okay, I think we've got time for, let's see, who haven't we, how much, what do we got left here? So let's go. Let's go live again. Let's try. Uh, let's go back to AFSOC. ladies. There we go. <laughs> hey, sir. I have a two-part question. Uh oh. Um, <laughs> it's kind of it. Military spouses are strong, intelligent, resilient men and women that want to be communicated with and feel validated. In the POTA Family Symposium last year, we learned that we have all the programs we need, but we just need to know how to utilize them and know where the problems are. The outcomes were to identify SOCOM baseline for family programs, identify existing gaps in family needs, and identify how SOCOM can assist components. Right. Do you feel these have been reached and how have they implemented in order to make the families feel heard? 
Yeah, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, so, um, you know, one of the things, in fact, uh, that I was talking to the, again, the, the commanding officers about today is communications. Uh, for those of you that were there last year when George Ann and I and, uh, and Command Sergeant Major and his wife, Lisa, kind of went around and met with all the spouses that we could and all the service members, what I found constantly, almost every place we went was there was not as good a communications as it could have been. So invariably, a, a spouse would stand up and say, you know, we don't have programs for X. And five other spouses would say, would jump up and say, well, yeah, we do. So, well, nobody's talked to me about it. So it is clear, there was clearly a communications issue here. Now, I don't want to tell you there's not a gap. I think there is a gap. And, and we are working to close it. But, uh, but the communications is key. So well, and that's one reason why we're having the Facebook well, that, thing. We're, yeah. we're hoping that a forum like this can help. Um, help us find out how to get the word out to you about the things that we're doing. Well, and as you may be aware, you know, one of the things that popped up was Facebook. And somebody said, uh, hey, you know, uh, all, all the spouses communicate by Facebook, but oh, by the way, you know, Unit X won't allow me to have a Facebook. <laughs> so, of course, I went to all the unit commanders and said, Put a fa make a Facebook page, get it up and running. Uh, we did the same thing here at SOCOM, and, and Dan Wade, who's off screen here, kind of put my Facebook together, and, and frankly, it's been uh, pretty effective. Uh, so uh, kind of to answer your question, I don't think we're there yet, uh, and I'm not sure we'll ever get completely there, but we're going to do everything we can to kind of close the gap uh, to make sure we're, we're, again, giving you the programs that, uh, that you need. So again, I'm, I need your help in continuing to identify this. I've got thick skin. So do not hesitate to let me know when you know, the emperor's got no clothes. I mean, if somebody's up here telling me that, oh, yes, Admiral, everything's just fine, and, and you folks out there you know, in the enterprise say, yeah, it's not really fine, they're just telling the Admiral that, feel free to communicate with me. Talk to me on Facebook. You know, let me know what's happening at, at ground level, and then I'll make sure that uh, I can do whatever I can to, to get it done. Okay, folks. Uh, or if you tell me, then I'll bug him <laughs> about it. <laughs> no, that will absolutely happen. Okay, folks. Uh, I'm afraid I have uh, have gone over here, but uh, but I'll just close it out by saying one. Uh, hopefully, this was of some value to you. Uh, I'm going to try and do one of these about once a quarter. And if George Ann and I aren't doing it, I'll get my deputy or the command sergeant major and his wife to uh, to participate. I want to make sure we've got good lines of communications open. Uh, I am kind of convinced, that was a great last question from, uh, from AFSOC, that really if we communicate more, then I'm in a better pos position to kind of help you solve some of these problems. So one, uh, I'll close by telling you how very, very much I appreciate uh, everything you, know, you are doing as family members, uh, that your husbands and wives are doing as service members. Uh, our credibility as a special operations community I don't think has ever been higher. And it is so high because of the great work being done downrange in Afghanistan and in the 78 other countries that we're in around the globe every day. And what happens back here in the continental United States and the, the great work that, uh, that all of you and your, your families are doing. So uh, on behalf of George Ann and I, let me say thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to, to meeting some of you as we continue to kind of travel around the the continental United States here in the next year. And, uh, and again, thank you for your, your service and your sacrifice.